really helping us protect these rainforests. So my name is Paul Telfer. Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, I was born an American, <laughs> sadly, <laughs> but I've been living in Africa since 1991, and I consider myself a, a citizen of the globe these days, especially with our current president. <laughs> so <laughs> I would like to talk to you today about the Republic of Congo and what we're doing in the rainforest of Africa and the Congo Basin. So if you close your eyes and you imagine the jungles of Africa, that's what we have. We have 50 meter high canopies, we have vines reaching down to the ground, we have gorillas, we have chimps, we have forest elephants, we have clear running streams running through these forests. It is really the last jungles of Tarzan, as you imagine it. It's in the Congo Basin. And if you close your eyes and you picture tourism in Africa, you're gonna picture the migration across the Serengeti, you're going to picture a sunset behind a fever tree in South Africa. You're going to picture the Okavango Delta or the Namibian Desert. But no one thinks about rainforests in Africa, and yet it covers one third of the continent. Now, we have started our project in the Republic of Congo, not to be confused with the democratic or so called democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> and most people don't know there are two Congos. Now, I'm sure you guys all do, but one of the reasons is that the media never talks about our Congo, the Congo Brazzaville, the French Congo. And that's because nothing bad really happens there. It has a very different colonial history. It has a very different post-colonial history. It's been very stable for the years that have passed since um, its independence. Um, Brazzaville was the seat of free France during World War II. And I don't know if any of you saw the movie Casablanca, but when <laughs> Humphrey Bogart was getting on the airplane, that plane was actually flying to Brazzaville. Um, Brazzaville was recently written about in Forbes magazine as one of the safest and cleanest capital cities in the continent. Now, I actually live in camps in, in, in Cape Town these days, and I live behind a walled house and electric fence. In Brazzaville, I lived there for six years, and I never locked my doors at night. Now, I started in Africa in 1991. I was working at a primate research facility in Northern California where the first uh, primate HIV-like virus was discovered. And back in 1991, we didn't know anything about the human AIDS epidemic. And the guy I worked for got a grant from the US government to go out and try and find the origin of the huge human AIDS epidemic. And I was hired as a project director to go to Africa and actually try and find how primate viruses might have gotten into humans and what was the variety of primate viruses. So my job was to actually drive around and take blood samples from captive primates to try and trap and release wild primates and to take samples from human beings who might have been exposed to primates and see if we could find some epidemiology that would explain the human AIDS epidemics. And so I ended up in Sierra Leone, which was a country in West Africa. Let me look back at the map, way over here. Which, when I read about it, I read that it was covered in forests. 75% of the country is in absolute rainforest. Monkeys are everywhere. It's absolutely amazing. And when I got there in 1991, that's me, very young me back there, <laughs> back in Kenema, Sierra Leone, um, and my wife. <laughs> um, we got there in 1991, and we were totally shattered because only 5% of the rainforest remained. And what remained of the primates was even less. They it was an extremely poor country. Um, it took me two years before I saw my first wild primate in Sierra Leone. I continued with the work, and I, working with the Lassa Fever Research Project, um, I took blood samples, and we lived there for three and a half years during the Civil War. And it was because of that that I, we ended up moving the grant over to Gabon, which, again, if we go back to the map, Gabon is this country here next to the Republic of Congo. And we had some research colleagues living in southern Gabon at a research facility there, a French research facility linked with Institut Pasteur, who invited us over knowing that we were suffering in Sierra Leone. Come to Gabon and continue work, run the grant out, it's very interesting. So I moved to Gabon, I didn't speak a word of French. I was, the uh, first 18 months was really difficult because the French really don't like to speak English. <laughs> and my job was to walk around and uh, drive around and take samples from wild primates. When I was living in Gabon, I also realized that taking samples from wild primates and captive primates was a bit tricky and I wasn't really happy with it. It stressed out the animals. So I was trying to develop non-invasive techniques for collecting 
samples that could be analyzed for virology. And by non-invasive techniques, that means really just finding their poop in the forest and, and analyzing, developing methods to try and analyze the poop and try and get virus out of the poop. So I hooked up with some conservationists who were working at a research facility studying chimps and gorillas in the center of the country in a reserve called the Lope Reserve. And in 1994, it was a Sunday afternoon and I had been there for three weeks collecting poop from the gorillas and chimps and I had a little portable laboratory and I was spinning it all down and crow preserving it and trying to do my best to do my virology work. Sunday afternoon, this young botanist says to me, he says, I think I might have discovered a new plant species. It's never been described by science. And it's up on the top of this little hill over here. And if you want to go for a walk this Sunday afternoon, I need to collect another sample during the flowering phase. So I said, hey, yeah, let's do that. So I followed this young botanist up this hilltop. And we collected the sample. It does turn out now that it was a new species to science. And when I speak to this story, speak to this friend of mine who showed me this, he says, oh yeah, that's old number 36, because that's how many species. <laughs> He's actually discovered more new plant species. Um, but that was the 36th new species to science that he discovered in this part of the world. But the rainforests in Gabon are absolutely intact. So this is a country that has 80% of its country is covered in rainforests and it's really intact. Um, Gabon has a very low population density and as a result, they just haven't had an opportunity to destroy it. So we were up there on the top of this hilltop and, and I hear a noise, I didn't know what it was. And, and my friend says to me, he says, oh, that might be wild gorillas. Let's go see if we can find them. I said, okay, let's go see if we can find them. <laughs> and he says, all right, now as we're getting closer, he says, it's got to move really slowly, really quietly. And he says, if we encounter the gorillas, you need to be very careful because they can be aggressive if they feel threatened. So if you see the silverback, don't look him in the eyes, drop to the ground and start tearing up leaves in front of your face. Basically, you need to look like a non-threatening herbivore. I said, okay, <laughs> I'll do that. And so we're slowly creeping down this hillside and all of a sudden, just, just coming straight up at us is this 200 pound silverback male. Just grrr, grrr. Of course, I dropped down to the ground and started turning <laughs> leaves in front of my face as fast as I could. And uh, trying not to make eye contact, but looking at this magnificent creature who's parked himself 10 meters away from us. He's just standing here posing. <coughs> and then he sits down and he turns his back to us and just sort of has his head at an angle. We're still sitting here tearing up leaves and suddenly out of the forest appear 17 other family members of this silverback male. And they stayed with us for two hours. And that was my first gorilla experience in the world. It blew my mind. And when the gorillas decided they'd had enough, they just faded into the forest. And me and my friends stood up and we said, oh my goodness, that was incredible. And I was so touched that as we're walking down the hill, no longer sneaking and being quiet. I, said, oh, my I want to do what you do for the rest of my life. I want to do what you do for the rest of my life. This is awesome. He's like, well, I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society. It's a New York uh, based, it was formerly the New York Zoological Society. It's where the Bronx Zoo, it's a big American NGO and they do conservation around the world. I said, well, I want to work for WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society. He says, well, uh, 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 they only hire people with PhDs. I said, well, I'll get a PhD. <laughs> and he says, ha, 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 ha. Oh yeah, right. That's <laughs> because I've been out of school for 10 years. And um, so, little unknown to many people, I actually spent five days dogging this guy. And I said, how do I get a PhD? How do I get a PhD? And he was very patient, he and his wife. And they sat me down and they said, okay, these are the schools you could apply to. These are the professors that might take you. What are your research questions? Well, within 18 months, I was in a PhD program at New York University studying uh, physical anthropology, which is where we couch primatology in the United States, because most primate research has to be done in the context of how humans um, evolved. And so I was a member of the consortium of uh, the New York Consortium of Evolutionary Primatology, and I did my PhD, and I did my PhD on mandrels, <coughs> the species mandrel is sphinx, and it's found mostly in Gabon, primarily a little bit in southern Cameroon and just a tiny bit in southern Congo. And I took blood samples and non-invasive tissue feces samples from 72 animals and discovered that mandrels north and south of the main river that bisects their territory <coughs> have not crossed, have not been crossbreeding for about 1.5 million years. Wow. And the accumulated genetic difference is enough to name a new subspecies. So um, the new subspecies hasn't been named yet because I immediately got hired after I got my PhD by WCS <laughs> and started working for them. But um, if I do, I, I, the, the, the species is Mandrillus sphinx, 
And so the first species would be, subspecies would be Mandrillus sphinx sphinx, and the second would be Mandrillus sphinx avaensis, after my daughter Ava. Um, and this is just a genetic example. You can just see how very distinctly clear the breakups are. So that was my PhD, and as soon as I finished my PhD, the young botanist who showed me that new plant had been busy while I was working on my PhD. And he and this fellow named Michael J. Fay, who was an American explorer working for National Geographic, put together a stunt called the Mega Transect. And this is basically in 1999 and 2000, they, Mike Fay walked from Northern Congo to the coast of Gabon through untouched, unspoiled rainforest. And he stopped every 50 meters and he filmed it. And he went with pygmies, carried them the whole way. It took him 18 months and it was filmed and then National Geographic made an incredible film about it. And, um, and if anyone likes, I could even give you a digital copy. But at the end of the film, the, the trackers who had been with him the entire time, porters had gone all this distance to the coast. They were within 11 kilometers they decided they had enough and are going home. <laughs> and, and Mike is just yelling at them and he's screaming at them and they're just refusing, they're not budging. And he's like, for an hour, and this is all being filmed by National Geographic, and certain clips of this make it into the film. So <laughs> what's interesting is when the film was released, copies were given to the Gabonese government and Mike and Lee, the, our friend, um, were there at the WCS uh, rest house and all of a sudden the Minister of Defense shows up and is the son of the president shows up at the house knocks on the door says my father would like to see you now and uh, they don't know what it's all about and uh, they're a little bit afraid because Mike was really yelling at these Gabonese people and calling them all sorts of names and they go to the prison office and they're ushered into this showing room and there is President Omar Bongo in front of the television laughing <laughs> and he says, my goodness, Mr. Mike Fay, I would like to say to you that now you know what it's like to be the president of this country. <laughs> really hard to get these people to do anything. <laughs> he says, but I also would like to thank you for showing me my beautiful country. I had no idea what we have. And I would like to create national parks. And so he said, I'll give you a month. I said, prepare the document for the national parks. And so in August 2002, in a single pen stroke, President Omar Bongo signed 13 national parks created all the same thing, covering 17% of the national territory. So Lee White was working for WCS and he hired me as a project director, working in the Ivindo National Park and in the Bateke National Park over the course of six years. And then I became the country program director in the Republic of Congo, after all my experience. And Gabon and Congo, they share a border the rainforest in northern Congo and southern Congo are contiguous with Gabon, and it's one of the most incredible blocks of untouched, pristine rainforest left in the Congo Basin. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Ozala, which is right here. Ozala is 1.3 million <coughs> hectares, 13,000 square kilometers of untouched, unspoiled rainforest. It's never been logged, never been commercially hunted, and people haven't lived in the inside of the park on a permanent basis for, for probably thousands of years. I worked for WCS in Brazil from 2008 until 2014. While I was working in WCS, WCS had created Nibali and Doki National Park. They had created, they helped <coughs> keep Kumquati going. They created in Tukupikundu. We were managing the Lactelli Reserve and working on creating a new national park here called Adui Lakedi. And what I realized as country program director was that the relationship between the national parks and the government was so fraught with tension that we were not actually making headway. The government just wanted to turn the national parks into logging concessions to sell them to the Chinese. They kept saying, what do we get out of it? You guys are protecting it and you're monitoring it, but what do we get out of it? And when the European Union funded project that was managing Ozala stopped, stopped operating, the government of Congo said, to a South African NGO called the Leadership of Conservation in Africa, that we want you to help us find investment and to help us develop Ozala. And so the, the CEO of the NGO at that time invited the minister to South Africa and introduced him to the CEO of a South African NGO called African Parks. Now African Parks manages parks in Africa as an NGO, but they only do it by taking a delegated management contract for 30 years. 
And that means the government has to basically say, you manage our park for us, you take all the revenue and you make it sustainable. And then after 30 years, you give it back <coughs> as an operating self-sustaining national park. And they've been very successful across many parts of Africa. When this was proposed to Minister Jumbo, the Ministry of For Minister of Forestry, he threw up his hands. He said, I would never be able to convince my president to give away a sovereign park to a South African NGO. And he walks out the room. And the board members of the Leadership for Conservation are all on the table, which included the president <coughs> of Standard Bank and Howard Buffett, the American philanthropist, and several other very prominent business leaders were all sitting there going, what do we do now? They grabbed Minister Jumbo, they brought him back in, and the moderator said, Minister, before you leave, we just want to say to you, you want investment in your park. You want us to develop your park. But let's ask these businessmen and women what you what is needed. And so he said, all right, I'll listen. And the first guy says, Minister Jumbo, I want to be candid with you. Your government is one of the most corrupt governments in all of Africa. <laughs> You've got a whole series of national parks and where you don't have an NGO partner, they're paper parks. They don't exist. They're even worse than that. They're completely hammered. He says, where you do have an NGO present in these co-management agreements, you take their money and you don't give them the results and they're frustrated and they're not having a good relationship and they're constantly worried. So if you want investors, you've got to give a delegated contract to somebody like African Parks where I wouldn't invest. And one by one, they went around the table and they all said that. And finally, they came to the last board member who is Madam Sabine Plattner, and she's a German conservationist and philanthropist, and she says the same thing. And she says, but Minister Jumbo, I'm also, I'm a businesswoman, but I'm also a conservationist. And if you take African Parks, I will invest. That silence is what we heard from Minister Jumbo. He says, okay, I'll do that. And so Mrs. Platner said, I'll invest. And he signed the contract with African Parks. I was there as WCS <coughs> witnessing this. And she said, I'm going to invest in tourism in Odzala as a conservation commerce. I don't want to do tourism, but it's necessary for the park to be protected and well managed. And I don't need to get any money out of this. And I don't need to get a return on my investment. In fact, I promise never to take any money out of Congo. And so in 2012, she started the Congo <coughs> Conservation Company, and she hired Wilderness Safaris to build and manage some lodges for her. Now, what she didn't understand, and no one did at the time, is that Wilderness Safaris has no experience operating in Fr French-speaking Africa. And so they struggled to put their South African and East African model into Congo, and Mrs. Platner got very frustrated with them, and in 2014, she called me up and she said, Paul, <laughs> I, uh, I need your help. I need you to help me with my projects. And I said, but Sabina, I work for WCS. I have, a, I have a career with WCS. She goes, look, if we can't make it work with African parks and my philanthropic contributions, we're not gonna make it work in any of the national parks in Congo. I said, you know what, you're right. I'll come on board. So in the meantime, as WCS, I actually created a very similar public-private partnership for New Bayern Loki, which is this park here which is based on the African Parks model. So WCS and African Parks both have delegated management contracts, and that is to be uh, to the good credit of the Congolese government who have done that. Um, but as a result, we now have three lodges in Ozala National Park. Well, two lodges in the park and one just outside the park. This is Brazil, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about them and their role in the conservation and what they play the role that they play in Brazzaville and Brazzaville Congo. So again, this is the good Congo. This is the not so good Congo. <laughs> no, that's, that's really unfair to DRC. DRC is actually a fabulous country. It's the largest country in the continent now. It used to be Sudan, but Sudan's now been cut in two. So you hear a lot of negative press about Eastern DRC. You never hear about Central DRC or Southern DRC or Western DRC. Bad stuff that's happening in East Arden DRC is actually closer to Zanzibar than it is to Brazzaville. But yet it's still very difficult for people to get their head around going to Congo. Well, we're Congo Brazzaville, we're the good Congo. And that doesn't mean there's a bad Congo. So Brazzaville's the capital city. The economic capital is on the coast, it's Point Noir, and that's because <laughs> Congo has oil. And it was written about by Forbes, again, I said this earlier, as one of the cleanest and safest capital cities in the country. And when you fly into Brazzaville, you come into the new airport, the immigration officers, as immigration officers everywhere, are always grumpy and they're going to stamp your passport and never smile. But when you show them the letter of invitation from, from Ozala, they're like, oh, Ozala, welcome to Brazzaville. <laughs> it's 
it's incredible. So for the first time ever, the government of Congo is starting to see a value in their national parks now that we're bringing tourists in. When you ask a Congolese citizen, what are you proud of about being Congolese? Our independence from France, um, you know, a few other little things, you know, we've got to, you know, I don't know, the Braza. But now they're starting to say, well, we've got, we've got Ozala. People are coming to Ozala. The way the government is looking at Ozala right now has removed the question of whether or not they're going to create a, a logging concession and sell it to the Chinese. So when you come to Brazzaville, we can give you a tour of the city. This is uh, the mausoleum of De Braza. So the Congolese, like I said, has a very different post-colonial trajectory. De Braza, who founded the sort of French protectorate, is still very highly revered. And in, uh, I think it was about 2010, they negotiated with the family and they went and brought his bones that were in a cemetery in, uh, in Algeria and brought him back and he's honored in the capital city right next to the mayor's office. There's a church here that we can visit. The roof is made out of malachite. It's absolutely stunning. We take our guests to the market. There's a, some, there's an art school. It's an absolutely incredible experience and it's a really charming capital city of Africa. You fly into the international airport. It was built by the Chinese, but it's a stunning, beautiful airport. And quite frankly, when I first got there, the airport was just a cement box and nothing worked. It's a great pleasure. And like I said, the immigration authorities are all very happy. And one of the reasons that Ozala National Park, 1.3 million hectares, 13,000 square kilometers, is still intact is because it's very isolated. And because it's very isolated, it's a 16 hour drive. Nobody wants to spend that time in a car. So we actually have an aircraft on site. If you overnight in Brazzaville, we'll put you in the Radisson. Um, it's Radisson Blue. It's not the best, it's not the worst, but it's a known quantity. You know what you're gonna get. It's, it's safe, it's clean. And then we take you from the hotel to our airplane that lands on our airstrip in the park. And then you're met by your guides <laughs> who will be with you on the entire trip. We have three camps and each of the three camps is very different. And each of the three camps is in a different ecosystem. And we land you in the park and we take you to the first camp. We're gonna spend seven days in Ozala because you want to, if you're going to spend the time to come to Congo, you want to see and do as much as you can. You don't want to leave feeling that you've left something out. So we're going to take you to the first camp, which is in Gaga. And in Gaga is where we have the Western Lowland Gorillas. So there's a researcher who's a friend of mine, and I've known her for nearly 20 years now. She's been in this part of the world for probably 25. And she has, she's a She's a professor at University at Barcelona University, and she's a primatologist, and she has habituated two groups of Western lowland gorillas, and she's been studying the gorillas in this neighborhood for more than 15 years. This is the neighborhood. This is the rainforest. It's a Marantasi forest, it's a closed canopy. This is the lodge in the clearing. So here's the main area, and then there are six bungalows around into the forest. It's the center and the heartland of the gorilla home range. It's a beautiful lodge. It's all made with the sustainable harvested timber. So another great thing about Northern, Cal Northern Congo is that the large logging concessions that are between Ozala and Nubalandoki to the north are all FSC certified. So that means that timber has been harvested as sustainably as possible. Communities are also compensated for being <coughs> involved in the activities. And it's a, it's, a, it's a green label that if you're gonna have logging, you want it to be FSC certified. Now as a conservationist, I'd rather not have logging but you know everything that we have is either harvested, mined, or grown somewhere, and we just have to do it sustainably. So it's a beautiful lodge. Um, just to give you an idea of the common area and what the rooms look like, the rooms are actually designed to look like local housing or pygmy huts. <coughs> and uh, the big difference being that pygmy huts don't have beds or windows or ablutions on the inside, but uh, we have a 24-hour electricity and uh, hot and cold running water. Now, the great thing about Ngaga is you're gonna get there in the late afternoon and you're gonna be met by one of Magda's teams, Magda being the researcher. She works with these trackers who have been previously hunters and they know the forest as well as anybody. In fact, I like to say they have a PhD in forestology because they probably know it better than a PhD knows their own subject. So they're, gonna, they, they're out following the monkeys, every, the, the, the apes every day and they're gonna come in the evening and they're gonna give you a gorilla briefing. They're gonna to talk to you about 
where the gorillas are, what they're doing, what they're doing in their habitat, any interactions they may have had, and, and, and how you need to behave when you're with them. And that doesn't mean you have to sit down and tear up leaves and become a non-threatening herbivore. <laughs> <laughs> Our gorillas are habituated. <laughs> but we do ask that you respect the IUCN guidelines for best grade ape tourism practices. We don't want to bring any stress or have a negative impact on these groups because they're very fragile, they're very similar to humans, and any colds or flus that we might bring into the area can be lethal to them. We know from research on great apes in East Africa that uh, polio and measles is deadly, and we've had researchers bring those into naive populations and burn through. So we ask that our guests show that they've been vaccinated or have a, at least a doctor write a note that says they believe you've been vaccinated. You know, a lot of people like me, I don't have those records from when I was a child, but if you've gone to school, we know you're vaccinated. We ask that you wear a mask when you're in their presence, and we ask that you respect a distance of seven meters which is there. And this is Jupiter. Jupiter is one of the silverbacks in charge of the two group, or he's a silverback in charge of his own group. He's one of two. Um, this is what people come to Congo to see. These groups are, you're in their home range. When you wake up in the morning, you're gonna have a very quick bite to eat and a coffee, and then you're gonna be walking out your door, maximum four people. You're not gonna drive anywhere. You're not gonna have to wait in a line. You're not gonna be with 100 people pulling names out of the hats. You're actually gonna be with a maximum of four people and a tracker and a guide, and you're in their habitat. You could find them as quickly as 20 minutes. It depends on what they're doing. It could take two hours. But it's flat, it's an easy walk, um, it's a grid trail. Um, they're wild animals, so we never know what they're gonna do. We know where they slept the night before, so we can get you there as quick as possible. You're gonna spend an hour with them, and it's one of these experiences. I, I like to ask people not to use their camera for, for at least the first 10 minutes. Look at it with your eyes. Mm -hmm. Get the feeling for what it's all about. When you're in the presence of a 200 kilo male who's protecting his family and the family is very curious about you, it's just humbling. The mountain gorillas, there's only about 800 of them and they're all on top of these three volcanoes. And we know where they all are. It's a semi-captive population. They can't go anywhere. These, there are 300,000 Western Lowland gorillas between Gabon, Congo, Cameroon, and Central African Republic. But they can just disappear. If they don't want to be seen, and they don't want to be observed, they're gone and you'll never even know it. We're very lucky we've got these two groups. That's Jupiter. Neptune is the silverback of the other group. And you're usually back in camp by lunch. And that's such an easy experience. So the first night you're there, the second day you're gonna wake up, you're gonna go see the gorillas, you're gonna have lunch, and then what? <laughs> You're gonna have a lovely lunch. But then we're actually gonna offer you some other hikes to go out and see the monkeys that you weren't looking at because you're gonna walk right past them because you're so focused on the gorillas. We've got nine other species of primates. We've got incredible bird life. We've got little areas where you can have streams. We actually offer night walks as well. This is an area that's very safe, so we can go out with night the spotlights and see pottos and bats and galagos. Uh, there's lots of other things. There's some incredible fluorescent bugs that are really cool. Our guides are very well trained, very well. Um, they're going to be with you the entire trip. You're going to go back to sleep that night. You're going to wake up, and the next day you're going to see the second group. So it's sort of a repeat experience, but it's a slightly different experience because you're going to see the other group. And both groups are, they're both gorilla groups. They're both silverbacks with their families of close to similar sizes. One has 17 and the other has, I think, 21 family members but they behave differently. And Neptuno is a little more, um, Jupiter's very laid back and Neptuno is more of a poser. <laughs> um, yes. So you're gonna, you're gonna spend three nights at that camp. You know, the first night you arrive, you get prepped. The next morning you do your first gorilla trek, the second night, the third day you're gonna do your, 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 the second day you're gonna do your second trek and then the next day you're gonna transfer to the next camp. So you're gonna have three nights at this camp and then you're gonna transfer into Longo Camp, which is in the heart of the park, and it's in a clearing in, a, in the forest that has high concentrations of mineral salts, and it's called a bai. And a bai is actually a word from the Baaka pygmies, which means a clearing in the forest with high concentrations of mineral salts. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you transfer, is it by car? Or? Well, you're gonna drive in a game viewer through the park entrance, and there's a town called Mbomo, and that's the park headquarters. Um, 
Mrs. Platner, the owner, she's also very strong. Um, she feels very strongly about making sure the communities benefit. So not only do we give 5% of our revenue directly to the communities and a community development fund, she's also built a community center where she provides free early childhood development to the children of the village. And she's got seven of these satellites all around the park to try and cover everything. Um, and if you happen to be passing through on a day when the kids are at school, you can stop and share smiles. Um, so when you get into the heart of the park, you're gonna have a, a, a light meal, and then you're gonna get into kayaks, and you're gonna actually kayak into the next camp. Your bags will be brought around and we'll be waiting for you in your room. But we like to make the transfer into an activity. And we have kayaks. If you are not comfortable kayaking, it's not a problem. We don't make you kayak, you can go around with the bags. But it's, a, it's an incredible activity. If you wanna have your own kayak, you can go on your own. If you wanna go with a guide and you, he can do the paddling or she can do the paddling for you. If you wanna get a divorce, you can go with your spouse. Um, <laughs> um, but it's all downstream, it's very easy, but it's a fantastic way to see the wildlife because you're quiet, they're quiet, and it's just a, a, an amazing way to see the wildlife. So this is Longo By. This is the lodge. There's a little walkway here, and the kayaks come down the main river that's parked here, and then you actually finish the journey by walking in. Now, you're gonna see this rainforest that has not been touched in 10,000 years. This is the same rainforest, the same way the great explorers have seen it. So you're literally walking in the footsteps of the last great explorers, Stanley, Livingston, De Braza. And in fact, there's an archeological site here with lots of pottery shards that have been accumulating for probably about 1800 years. And the reason that pottery is there is because the, the local people used to also collect salt there. They'd put the water in the pots, they let the water evaporate out, and they'd take these salts out. And they'd use that salt actually when they went to the coast, taking slaves to be sold on, along the coast. Because as hunters, they can cross the forest, no problem. There's lots of stuff to eat. But salt is the one keystone resource that they don't have and they don't know about. So when they can go through unknown territory, they, can, they don't need to take anything except their salt and their hunting utensils. Jacques de Braza was here in 1895, and he wrote about the black salts of Mboko in his journals that are in the Museum of the Natural History in Paris. You are literally walking in the footsteps, seeing the rainforest the same way they did. The only difference is when you come out of the forest, you've got a hot shower, clean sheets, and a cold gin and tonic. Yes. <laughs> this is the view coming into the lodge. This is the main area. And I'm just gonna give you a quick briefing of the lodge itself. It's very similar. The units are very similar to the ones at Ngaga. They're, they're same architectural concept. The difference is that this lodge is actually, because the, the by is an ecologically sensitive area, the lodge is up off the ground. So you never actually are walking on the ground except for when you come through. You're up at three meters and you're in the canopy. And so for people who like to look at birds and the primates and the other wildlife, we've got pygmy squirrels and lots of stuff like that. You're right there, you're right there with them and it's an incredible opportunity to see the wildlife while you're just in the camp. And of course, there you are in the main unit looking out over the by. There are incredible activities. This is the, the lodge, the rooms, but here I wanna point out, this is the kind of activities that we do. We walk through the rainforest the same way the great explorers did. You don't have to get muddy, but we encourage you to get out there. <laughs> we have dry walks, they're somewhat limited. Our guides know these trails very well, but this is the, this is the opportunity if you put in the effort, you're gonna see lots of wildlife. If you're tired and you don't really feel like it, you could sit on the deck and the wildlife will more often than not come to you. And at night, the number of elephants that come into this by is just amazing. And quite often it's difficult to sleep because they're making so much noise. It's almost like a nightclub for them. So we encourage you to get out and walk in the footsteps of these explorers, because if you do, you're gonna see the wildlife. Bring your macro lens if you're a photographer. There's incredible um, butterflies and insects there's local colobus, the bird life is amazing. Small to big, these are bongo. We don't guarantee sightings of bongo, but bongo is the second largest antelope and they're abundant in this rainforest. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the rainforest hides its animals. Now our guides are very knowledgeable and we have certain areas where we know that these animals come to frequently, but there's no guarantees. But if you put the effort in, you often will see these things. It's not just the mammals that come to the bay. We have flocks of 50, 60 African gray parrots that come down. Wow. These are incredible birds. We've got a small hide 
that if you want to get up early in the morning and not go on the walk, you can just sit in the hide and try and get pictures. We have flocks of five or 6,000 green, green pigeons that come in for the mineral salts. And what's really cool is they'll circle around and circle around being very wary of any predators before they land. And then they land and you just see them coming down and then all of a sudden a fish eagle will fly by and all the, you just hear this <laughs> 5,000 birds taking off all at once. It's absolutely mind boggling. So you're gonna do two nights at Longo on the by. You're gonna do lots of walking activities and then you're gonna transfer to the third camp which is where you're gonna spend your last two nights. And that transfer is also an activity. You're gonna have a short drive, about 20 minutes, and then there's a short walk across a, a boardwalk like this through a semi-flooded rainforest, which is only 700 meters, but it's a beautiful 700 meters. And you're just going to see, it's a closed canopy, but it's only at about four meters instead of the 40 meters that most of the other canopy is. It's absolutely amazing, the bird life, the butterflies, the dappled sunlight coming through. It's an experience all in itself, and that is the, the, the boardwalk we call the shortcut that takes you to Mboko. Now what's cool about Mboko <coughs> is one of the things I learned during my studies uh, working on mandrels, one of the reasons that these populations of, of primates who are contiguous haven't been interbreeding is because over the last two and a half million years we've had about 20 cycles of ice ages. And it's during these ice ages when the, when the climate, uh, the planetary climate is much cooler and much drier, the tropical rainforests were shrinking and savannas were taking over. And of course, in between the ice ages, when it's warmer and wetter, the rainforests grow back and, and, and push away the savannas. And this has been happening in pulses over 20 times in the last two and a half million years. The most recent ice age ended somewhere between 20 and 10,000 years ago. And the rainforest has been for the last 10,000 years really taking over the savannas. There is a, and we call that a in these areas where there's some relics of savanna populations, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a forest savanna mosaic. And Mboko happens to sit in one of these forest savanna mosaics. It's, it's quite small. It's in the middle of the rainforest. But you get this wide open <coughs> savanna feeling. Although all the bungalows are actually in the, under the trees, the main unit's open and there's always a cool breeze coming through there. You've got your forest wildlife, but you also have a relic population of spotted hyenas. And this is one of the few places in Africa where you can see rainforest birds and some savanna birds in the same ecosystem. And Mboko is a site that the villagers have always considered a special site. It's not a sacred site in the sense that there's, you know, taboos or things linked to it, but it's always a place where they go to, to rejuvenate their spiritual energy. And as an evolutionary biologist, I don't really know about spiritual energy, but I can tell you when you sit here and it's a hot day, there's always like a cool breeze blowing through here. And it's one of these few places that you just feel something special. And I have to agree with the villagers. We have a nice, beautiful fire deck, and of course you eat very well. We've got the, this is the shortcut where you come across. You can, it's a nice, beautiful swimming hole. Um, the units are all nestled in the, the forest, and each unit has a look over to the small stream that goes into the Lakoli River. We offer hiking activities. Our guides are, again, very knowledgeable. You'll see this little blip there on top of that elephant. Our partners, African Parks, they actually have collared, I think they've collared 17 elephants, and they've got another nine planned. So they're really good conservation partners <laughs> with us, and the elephants, they know where they are. Many of these elephants actually go into Gabon, believe it or not. You know, they don't have passports, but they still manage to cross the border. Um, but the real activities in Boko are the boating activities. And what's really cool is this is a wide river. We take you upstream a couple hours. You flow quietly down with the, the cold drinks. It's an amazing way to see the wildlife. Again, if you see something interesting, our guides will pull over. You can actually get out and walk around and explore. There are a few small hippo areas quite far upstream. It's rare to see the hippos, but if we see tracks, we can get out and try and, try and locate them. We will often, but not every day, see the slender snouted crocodile sunning itself, sunning itself on one of the logs. It's just an amazing way to see the rainforest. Unfortunately, this is where you do kind of get some biting flies. I'm a conservation biologist, but I'd like to put every titi fly and make them extinct, <laughs> unfortunately. But if you wear long pants and you put your repellent on, it's not an unpleasant journey at all. And this gives you just an idea. This is the rainforest. You're going through the rainforest. You can see the savanna forest mosaic back in through here. Again, it's, it's a beautiful spot. You've got the forest buffalo coming into the savanna. This is the kayaking. 
What's great about Mboko is it's where you're gonna spend your last night. You can stay up late, sitting around the campfire, having a few extra glasses of wine, because the next morning, you don't have to get up super early. You're gonna sit around, you know, a nice leisurely breakfast, and the plane's gonna leave at nine o'clock in the morning, and you're back in Brazil. Wow. And that is a seven day package. That is an opportunity to discover the Congo Basin. It's an opportunity to do all these activities, not miss a single one. But if you're interested, and because Odzala is just one national park, and our goal is not to save just one national park. Our goal is to actually save the Congo Basin and create an awareness around the world of Congo Basin activities. We have invested in a small business in Central African Republic. Uh, there's a South African birder, his name is Rod Cassidy, and he's been operating a lodge in Sanga Sanga National Park in Central African Republic, which is located right here. And this is a park that has access to a clearing in the forest called Zangabai. And Zangabai, I'm just gonna skip ahead really quickly if I've got a picture of Zangabai, is a clearing in the forest that is loved by elephants. It is famous, there have been lots of documentaries. Uh, I've been there probably 15, 20 times. I've never been there when there haven't been at least 30 elephants. Now, forest elephants have a very different social structure than savanna elephants. Savanna elephants live in these large herds. They can be 50, 60 animals at a time. Forest elephants, the social structure is a matriarch and her offspring. All the males are solitary and the matriarchs don't come together in groups. So when you see this many elephants together, that represents quite a few numbers of family groups, social structure. And when they come into the clearing, it's as if they haven't seen each other in weeks and they all trumpet and they, the, the juveniles will run over and embrace each other. It's absolutely amazing. I say you never see less than 30 more often than not, you see over 80. A couple of times I've seen, most recently I saw 105 the last time I was there. And in the months of May and April, you've got bongo galore. It's almost guaranteed they're there on a daily basis. Forest buffalo, I've seen giant forest hogs in there. I've seen mixed troops of monkeys. It's an astounding place. Now just to go back a little bit, Central African public, you say, hmm, who'd want to go there? Bangui, who, 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 terrible. Actually, this little part of Central African Republic is so far removed from everything. The vast majority of that country is savanna, and it's just this little tiny fringe area down here that is rainforest. And it's actually closer to Congo than it is to anything else. And we've actually negotiated now, so we, we fly with our airplane to Cabo, which is an airstrip the WCS maintains. So I'm very familiar with that, and I know the people who manage it. We hop in our boats, which are these new boats that we've just bought from South Africa and shipped up and we take you 130 kilometers upriver into Sanga Lodge, 130 kilometers of UNESCO World Heritage Site. This area is three contiguous national parks, so you're going through this area that's never been exploited and never will be exploited. It takes about four hours. There's not a village along the way, except there's a tiny little outpost where you're gonna, your guide is gonna hop out with your passports and you're gonna get your visa right there on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it's all prepaid, no muss, no fuss. I take all the, it's actually quite funny because there's this little wooden shack there and you're like, what is that? And there's a little guy with a rubber stamp just waiting. <laughs> but you don't have to go through Bangui, you don't have to send your passport anywhere. Once you've gotten into Congo and you're on this trip, we've taken all of the, the fuss out of it. And it's a, a stunning trip, it's stunning. 130 kilometers of unspoiled, pure river, national park on either side. I don't know if there's any other large river of this size in the world, and even the Amazon. It doesn't have village after village every 10 kilometers. Because rivers are the main conduit. So Rod's Lodge was a hunting lodge that he bought in 2007. It was a bit run down when he bought it. Um, he stayed throughout all the civil unrest, and in 2013 didn't have a single client. But he kept his employees and the villagers employed because he said, if I go, they'll give up hope and they'll start, start poaching. So he stayed, he stuck it out. We've just invested close to a half a million euros in order to up, upgrade his facilities. And this is Mr. Rod right there with his wife, Tamar. Um, when he was younger, he was the youngest birder in South Africa to hit 6,000 species. I mean, he's an incredible birder. He doesn't care about elephants and gorillas. He's all about the little stuff. Um, in his concession, he's got pick authorities. For those of you who are birders, it's sort of the holy grail. Um, he's got what they call the Valley of Giants. And these are all 50 to 60 meter high trees that are probably 800 to 1,000 year old each. You can spend a day, um, you spend time at the, at the by, 
but you can also go out and hunt with the Baaka Pygmies. So culturally, it's an incredible place. So the Baaka Pygmies are the, the famous Baaka trackers that, that you, you read about, and they remain there in their natural state. They're very happy to have people come along with them, but they do things their own way. They're not gonna dress up in costumes, and they're not gonna do things for you, but they will take you out hunting. And it's something that, quite frankly, it's not for everybody, but if it's something that you're interested in, I can tell you, people have, they're deeply touched by it. So you're gonna spend three or four days there, and then you're gonna come back down the river. Our plane will pick you up, and you're gonna do one last night at Ozala before flying down to Brazil. And that's just the way, because the plane is actually based in Ozala, and that's just the easiest way to get you in and out. You don't have to go through Bangui. You don't have to deal with any of the, the situations that you might encounter. It's almost like staying in Congo, except that you have a new visa in your passport. Fly back down to Brazzaville. If you want to do a city tour, you can do a city tour. Um, before heading home, we're really sad to see you when you go. Um, but thank you for listening. <laughs>